seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, where it tells about in the first four verses, four angels holding the four winds so that war wouldn't devastate the world. And then it said, I saw another angel sending from the east having the seal of the living God. Those who know prophecy know that we're living in those wonderful days when God is sealing His people. <coughs> A lot of people have come to Him and they said, How in the world can you live without an intercessor in the days when the seven last plagues are falling? And you know what the answer is? You won't need one. For we're told in Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your need. If God's sealed children needed an intercessor, they'd have one. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus is going to be so close? The angels of the Lord will encompass about us. The Lord will perform a very, very special act of grace in the gospel by which His children will be sealed. God says, I'll supply all your need. If I should need an intercessor then... He'd give me one, but he knows I won't need one if I let him steal me now. And that brings us to Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is going to do a wonderful work. I don't profess to know all he's going to do. I don't profess to know that beautiful covering that he's going to bring over his people, by which you and I can live in this sight of a holy God without an intercessor, but I know He's going to do it because the Bible says, He that is righteous will be righteous still. It says, He that is holy will be holy still. It does say also, Let him that is unjust and filthy be filthy still. He will not force any of us. But He said, I'll, I'll bring about a very special act in my gospel of grace by which you'll be able to draw so close to me and have such protection from me and such a covering from me that you can live without an intercessor. I'll be your stay. I'll be your comforter. I'll be your strength. I'll be all that you need. The angel of the Lord will be with you. Your bread and water will be sure. But you won't be sinning anymore. Isn't that marvelous what the Lord's going to do? And I know that a lot of us are saying in our hearts, Oh, dear. My, I don't know how I can be in that number. And the Lord said, I'll take you right where you are. And I want to read to you another text. I love it. It's here in in Micah chapter 7, verse 18. And verse 19. You may want to make a note of it. I've loved it for years. Because if someone is here this evening who feels, I'm not ready, I'm just not ready, I'm not ready to live without an intercessor, remember what he is tonight. Notice what he does tonight. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. God does what? Everybody. He delighteth in mercy. Who is a God like on him? He delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Did you come in this evening? Sinful, unworthy. Almost hopeless. Who is a God like unto him? He said, I just delight in mercy. I just want to cast all your sins in the depths of the sea. He said, I'm pleading with you day by day. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will sup with him. I delight in mercy. Who is a God like me? I'll pardon iniquity. All their iniquity. I'll cast in the depths of the sea. Did you come in with iniquity? Was the devil hassling you? Think of what a wonderful Savior he is. You know, in our ministry, if we were to classify the men and women whom we know (coughs) who've been pardoned 
by the grace of God, it would be some group of people. I suppose, not at the very top of the list, but near the top of the list, as far as human beings concerned and our society is concerned, would be the homosexual. You have no idea, friends, how many homosexuals have found complete pardon and complete deliverance in Jesus Christ, in our ministry alone. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? Passeth by the transgression of his people. He delights in mercy. Don't let anybody give you the impression that God is saying there's something you will not forgive, there's something you will not cleanse, there's something over which you will not give victory. He will give victory over every besetting sin if we'll just open our hearts to it. I stand at the door and knock. Prostitutes, we've seen them become pure, clean, beautiful characters. In Jesus Christ. It's wonderful. I think probably the top of the list of those that we've seen pardoned by the Lord are uh, sanctimonious hypocrites. You know, they're the hardest to seek pardon because the Bible says sin is deceitful. Hebrews 3.13, it says, Exhort one another today while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And you see, sin is so deceitful that it makes a man, if he, if he keeps indulging in it, it can cause him to, to believe that he's, that he's a righteous man right in the depths of sin. I'm thinking of a man that was a member of my flock many years ago. He was, he was an adulterer and he was a thief and he was a sanctimonious hypocrite all in one. How about that? And he was such a sanctimonious hypocrite. I remember he came to my office one day. He had, he had this uh, holy face. You know, sanctimonious hypocrites have holy faces, extremely holy. His face was long, narrow, because he thought narrowly. And his step was very holy, because he, he knew so much of holiness. But he was a murderer. He was a an adulterer. He was a thief. And he was a member of my flock. And I didn't know that he was all of that at all. That's why hypocrites parade in beautiful clothing. Spiritual clothing. I remember still how he came in. It was over 30 years ago. He came in with that beautiful, sanctimonious face. And he said, Pastor, I have a great burden on my heart. He sure did. He had the burden of sanctimony. He had the burden of hypocrisy. He had the burden of filthiness in his life. He said, I have a great burden in my heart. Oh, is that right? I'm glad I didn't know who he was, <laughs> you know. I thought he's a pretty decent fellow. But the Lord reads the heart. He said, do you think that it's right for the treasurer of our conference... <clears throat> To preach against going to movies and go to the movies himself. And I'd been walking rather close to the Lord. And, and you know, when you walk close to the Lord, you find it so easy to think the best of others. Did you ever notice it? And when you're not walking close to the Lord, do you notice how, how you can think the worst of others? You see? The people who crucified Christ and reviled Him, they were thieves and robbers. And I said, well, I don't, I don't think he would do that. He would be a hypocrite if he did that. He said, that's just it. I said, I don't, think he's, I don't think he'd preach against going to movies and then show up at one. He said, I got it pretty straight. I'll share with him in a few moments where he got it straight from. 
I said, well, let's drop over and see him. The conference office was just on the other side of an alley. So we only had to walk across, just across an alley. I said, let's go over and see him. And I noticed all at once this man who was really quite agile uh, began to act like something like a palsied man. He said, no, I don't want to go. I said, well, yeah, let's ask him. That's where you find out. He said, well, uh, no. I, I said, yes. You see, I was his pastor. So right away I became quite powerful. And I took him by the arm. And I said, here we go, brother. That's what the Bible says. Talk to him alone. And you know, I was amazed. He seemed to be sort of sick. <laughs> kind of difficult to walk. But I was strong. <laughs> and I helped him. We walked right into the conference office. Walked right upstairs. Went right into the room where the treasurer was. <laughs> never told him what I came for. And never told him why I left. And it's been 30-some years and he doesn't know today. Walked in and I said, uh, oh, yes, I, 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 I got ahead of my story. He, when he said, I got it pretty straight. He said, last Thursday night, the place where he want, what went was the Meacham Theater. I got it that straight. Thursday night, last Thursday night at the Meacham Theater. So when I walked into the treasurer's office, <laughs> cold turkey. <laughs> I said, brother, were you at the Meacham Theater last Thursday night? He said, no, here's my itinerary. He was down about 150 miles. All we had to do was call the church. He spoke there, <laughs> 150 miles away. I said, thank you, walked out. I never said we came in because of so-and-so. He knew what we came in for, to find out whether he was at the Meacham Theater Thursday night. Thank you. Out we went. Walked downstairs, outside of the office, and I turned to my friend. And I said, you know, that would have been pretty bad for that man to have been preaching against the theater and to have gone to the Meacham Theater last Thursday night. That would have been pretty bad, wouldn't it? He said, that, that's what I'm saying. I said, but since he wasn't there, it is pretty bad to accuse him, isn't it? He said, I don't see anything wrong with it. Sin is deceitful. Sin engaged in long enough will make a man a thoroughbred, registered hypocrite that will explode and build the mistakes of another, real or imaginary, to cover his own sordid life. I said, you say you don't think so? You don't think so? And then the Lord impressed me. <laughs> I was his pastor. I said, who told you? Well, he said, I don't think we need to go into that. I said, that's exactly where we're going. We're going right into that right now. Amen. He said, well, I don't think, I think this is settled. No, I said, it's not settled. We're going. Who told you? And I had a glint in my eyes. And he knew I meant business. Well, he said, if you must know my wife. I said, here we go. He, he found it quite difficult to, now to get into the car. But I was as strong as I was to start with. And I assisted him with assurance. Drove over to his house. Said, let's go in. <laughs> Walked in the house. There was his wife. Sister, your husband tells me that you told him. <laughs> Isn't that straight? Isn't that straight? He got it straight. That brother so-and-so was at the Meacham Theater last Thursday night. Now, sister, who told you? And I still remember. Up went her hands. <laughs> she said, I don't want to get into trouble. I said, you're not getting in. You're already in. <laughs> you're not getting in. She said, but, uh, uh, no, I, I, don't want, I don't want to have anything. You're already there. And she saw a glint that meant business. If I ever meant business in my life, I meant it then. I said, sister, who told you? I don't want to get in trouble. You're not getting in, sister. You're already in. Clear up to your neck. Well, if you must know, my son... I said to the brother, let's go. Now he 
would like to have gone to bed and had hot and cold fomentations, but I was giving him hot and cold fomentations standing up. <laughs> Let's go, brother. Well, I, no, yes, sir, we're on our way. The Bible says, be, of strong, be strong and of a good courage. And I was both. Helped him in the car. I may have I had to use both hands. Drove over to the sanitarium grounds, and there was his son. Jumped out of the car, said, here we go. He tagged on because he wanted to know what was going on anyway. I said, young man, your father tells me that your wife, that his wife told him that you told her. Who told you? He said, nobody. What did you tell your mother for then? I didn't. You didn't. Your mother said you told her. Your mother said that you told her that that man was at the Meacham Theater last Thursday night. Your mother said so. She said you told her. Did you? No. Why did your mother say you told her? Well, he said, I told her this. I wouldn't put it past him to have been there last Thursday night. Sin becomes so deceitful that it caused the most wicked people living in the days of Jesus Christ to crucify the Son of God and wipe their heads at Him and ridicule Him and jeer Him who is absolutely innocent and spotless and undefiled in the bosom of infinite purity. Crucify Him, they cried out. Crucify Him. You see how terrible, deceptive sin is? But let me tell you of the grace of God. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? I had the privilege of standing by the side of that man after he had been exposed for his adulterous life and had been such a hypocrite that when he was caught up with the church board, he stood before the church board and preached them a sermon and told them that they didn't catch up with him in the right way. They should have used other methods, which if they had used, of course, he wouldn't have been discovered. And he opens some sacred volumes from my favorite author, Little Red Books, and he reads to them how they were all doing wrong. Can you see how deceitful sin is? I had the privilege of sitting by that man's side when the tears just rolled down his cheeks and he sobbed. And he said, Brother Coon, I've been living with that woman for months. And I'm crying out to God and asking Him to forgive me. Can I find forgiveness? I, brother, I said, you can find forgiveness. Who is a God like unto thee? that pardoneth iniquity, passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He delighteth in mercy. Don't you thank the Lord for such a Savior? He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, not merely forgive them. He will subdue them. They'll cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. The sin of thievery. The sin of homosexuality. The sin of prostitution. The sin of gross hypocrisy. Thank God. He stands at the door and said, Look, no one will pardon like, pardon like I will. Ephesians 4, 30. 28 to 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. I thank God for His wonderful pardoning grace. Don't you? I think perhaps one of the most outstanding cases of a person living in sin for 20 years straight happened down in the island of Trinidad. My wife and I at the time were living in the island of Grenada, British West Indies. 
Uh, I was the sole conference worker on that island. We had seven churches when we went there and ten when we left. And there was no other conference worker. So we're not supposed to leave that island without someone from the conference in charge. One Friday morning, I had a very strong impression that I should go to Port of Spain, Trinidad, about 150 miles away by boat. And I said to my wife that morning, I'm going to Trinidad. I'm going to Port of Spain, Trinidad. But <laughs> there's nobody here. I said, I know it, but we must go. I must go. She said, I'll go with you down as far as the, as the port. We got ready quickly. On the way in, she said, I believe I'll go with you all the way to Trinidad. When we arrived in Port of Spain, Trinidad, we walked up, took a taxi up to the conference office. They hadn't closed up yet, and they said, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. You know, Isaiah 42, 16 says, I'll bring the blind by a way they knew not. I said, I don't know. Dr. Millard, the pastor of the Port of Spain Church, walked up to me and said, look, you're going to be here the weekend? I said, yes. He said, I want you to preach for me Sunday night. I said, I didn't bring any notes. He said, well, preach without them then. I said, all right. Uh, the treasurer of the union, M.D. Howard and his wife, said, will you be our guests? I said, thank you. Sunday, as I was thinking of the sermon that night, and this will help us to realize what kind of a Savior we have, I fell on my knees and I opened my Bible and I said, Lord, I don't know what message you want given. I had a strong feeling in my heart that God had brought us there for some specific purpose, but what, I had no idea. Now on my knees, it seemed the Holy Spirit was saying, there's a special message I want you to give. I said, dear Lord, I don't want to give any message except what you want me to give. And on my knees, I began to leaf through the Bible and leaf through and leaf through and then leaf back. And by and by, I came to this text. Right. Blessed are they that are called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I sensed that the, the thought voice said, that's your first text. Right. Blessed are they that are called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you know who that is? That's every one of us here tonight. Amen? Every one of us. So I jotted it down. I went from text to text on the marriage supper of the Lamb. That night, as I walked onto the rostrum with Dr. Millard in front, myself following, and Pastor Yip, the third, there was, the church was full. With one of our church members was a guest who had never been in that church in her life. Twenty years before, she had attended a tent meeting by, uh, by Elder and Mrs. Butterfield, twenty years before that. She had come almost to the point of yielding to the Spirit. But as she did not yield to the Spirit, she went in the opposite direction and for 20 long years was living in open sin. She was there that night. Now notice what a kind of a Savior we have. As she sat there and Dr. Millard led the way and I followed and Pastor Yip followed, she whispered to the lady next to her. She said, I've seen that young man. See, that was several years ago. She said, I have seen that young man before, somewhere. I've seen exactly how he's dressed. As I stood up and opened the, the sermon with these words, Right! Two years before, she had seen me in a dream. She'd seen texts of Scripture let down from heaven on little ribbons. She had seen me taking these texts from these ribbons and writing them and giving them to the people. And every text I read that night, she had seen two years before. That woman had been living for 20 long years in open sin. What kind of a God do we have? She said, as she saw the choir, 57 members, as I recall, she said, I've seen the, this choir. She said, every text the man's reading, I saw in the dream. 
in her dream, seven people invited her to seven different churches. And in the dream, one lady, a Sabbath keeper, invited her to this church. And in the dream, she followed this lady. And she hadn't realized how much was being fulfilled until near the close of the sermon. And she had accepted the one invitation and had, re- and had rejected every other invitation of the other six whom she had seen in the dream two years before. And there she sat. And you know, I made a mistake. I closed my sermon that night without a special invitation. She turned to her friend and she said, Had he extended an invitation to accept Jesus Christ, I'd have done it. And I never knew a thing about it until my wife and I had gone back to Grenada and Pastor Yip was coming over, making a visit, and he told me what I've shared with you. I said, Oh, Lord, forgive me. I've always made invitations, almost always, to accept Jesus. I said, Dear Lord, would you please, for Jesus' sake, give me the opportunity to make amends. And you know what happened? The conference committee asked my wife and me to leave the island of Grenada and come to Port of Spain, Trinidad, for Dr. Millard and his wife had gone home on furlough. And I became the pastor of the Port of Spain church, held a series of meetings, And in this series of meetings, I extended calls to men and women, boys and girls, to accept the wonderful forgiving love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? And among those that made their way to the altar was this woman. And I had the privilege of lowering her body beneath that sacred water in the name of the Father, the Son, And the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He that is righteous will be righteous still. He that is holy will be holy still. And I'm going to come quickly. And I'll take you up through the flaming vault of the skies. Back, back, back to glory land. You'll go trooping through the gates to the new Jerusalem. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. And through God's own special act, of which I don't profess to understand, every sealed one will not need a mediator then. What a day is ahead of us. I stand at the door and knock. And my friends, he had been knocking at the door of that little woman 20 long years. Now, I don't know all about the intricacies of the Holy Spirit's pleading with one person for 20 years or 30 years or 70 years and another person being pleaded with a shorter period of time and dying. I don't profess to know that because I don't know it I like to echo the voice of the Holy Spirit today. If any man hear his voice, harden not your heart. Amen. Today. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know how long you're going to live. But I know one thing. There is no individual in all the universe like our Savior. He delights in mercy. He said, I'll not merely be merciful. I'll not merely forgive your sins if you'll come in penitence and tell me you're sorry. I'll not merely do that, but I'll seal you as mine throughout eternity. Talk about the mystery of godliness. Thank God for it. What do you say? So don't start worrying about that time of trouble. Don't start worrying about the time when there's no mediator. Rather say, Lord, I open the door. I invite you to come in. You made the world by the breath of your mouth, and you can make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. You can make me holy, though I cannot make myself. You can bring me to the place where I don't, I, I, I don't have to continue any habit of sin, because you're sealing me in your own mysterious and beautiful way. And you know, in every audience and every series of meetings like this, there are people 
balancing between a decision. My brother Clinton told me an experience he had. He said the conference had written out a letter to all the ministers, all the pastors, and they'd warned the pastors of a certain man that was a con man who would be visiting the churches with a very persuasive argument, but he was an imposter. He was a thief. And my brother Clinton said as he went into his study that Sabbath morning, this man that had been described came into the study and told the story just like he'd heard or read from the conference president. He said, I detected immediately. I knew what, who he was. But he said, he said, you know, I wanted to see him make a decision for Jesus. So he said, I said to him, uh, before we terminate this conversation, uh, would you stay for the 11 o'clock preaching service? Oh, yes, yes, you'd be glad to stay. He said, as I was preaching that Sabbath morning at the 11 o'clock service, I didn't stare at the man. But you know, you can look from right to left and you can immediately notice the countenance. He said, I saw again and again that the Holy Spirit was pleading with this man. He actually, you could detect from his countenance, he was wavering, balancing. Shall I just surrender this thing over to the Lord? And my brother was just pleading with souls to make that decision for Jesus Christ. Angels were hovering around. The Holy Spirit was speaking. Today, if any man hear his voice, said at the close of the service, the man, almost, but not quite, made the decision. Stepped back into my pastor's study, into my brother's study. My brother asked the deacons would all fill the room. And there they were. Every door was closed with the deacons standing there. And my brother said to him, I'm so sorry, but I'd like to read to you a letter. He read the letter to him that he'd received from the conference president. And the man said, I want out of here! I want out of here! I want out of here! And you know, I've thought of the day when sinners who refuse the sweet voice of God stand before Jesus. No longer a mediator, but a judge. Friends, by God's grace, the Lord doesn't want any of us to be in that situation. Amen. He wants every one of us to hear that sweet, lovely voice. Who oh, is a God like unto thee? That pardoneth iniquity. I delight in mercy. I'll put every one of your sins in the depths of the sea. Why not decide for me now? I can't say for the tomorrow. I recall a, a very amazing experience we had in the island of Trinidad. We're holding an evangelistic series. One night, after everybody had gone, three or four young men walked in. They walked right up and they said, we want to give our hearts to the Lord. It seemed so uncanny. The expression almost belied what they were saying. And we thought, well, let's do it. Let's pray. But everything about it was so uncanny, so mysterious. The, the deep repentance that you, you notice was missing. We prayed and went on their way. The next afternoon, we were conducting a funeral service out in the graveyard, having the committal after we left the church. And as we were having this committal service at, at uh, perhaps, oh, maybe 200 feet, quite near, there was another burial service being conducted. And I did something that I wouldn't have done once in a hundred times. Ours was through before theirs, and I stepped over in reverence until they had finished the committal service. And uh, I turned to someone and I said, uh, anybody here that I might know? And the man seemed to know us. Aren't you the people of the tabernacle? Yes. Yes. He said, do you remember three or four men came to the altar last night and pretended that they were repenting? Yes. He said, one of them was buried. 
in Trinidad, when we were there, a burial had to take place within 24 hours after death. Always. No exception. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. But I know one thing. The Holy Spirit saith today, If any man hear his voice, harden not your heart. I stand at the door and knock. I believe, my friends, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to many of our hearts. I believe their hearts of men and women, young men and women, older ones, boys and girls, who have made a decision for Jesus Christ. You've made a decision. And the Holy Spirit says, just make a deeper commitment. And you're saying, yes. Yes, Lord. Deeper yet. Deeper yet into the crimson flood. Deeper yet. Deeper yet under the crimson blood. Amen. I believe there are others who are once followers of Christ. You rejoiced in His love and His fellowship and you found that somehow discouragement took over. You know, it's easy to become discouraged. And many times we get discouraged because some professed Christian has said a very unkind thing, right? They've been very unfair. And the devil has, has sort of poured it on. And we thought, why in the world should professed Christians treat me this way? I know what you mean. And Jesus said, look, on Calvary's height, I said, Father, forgive all of them. They don't realize what they're doing. And some time later, there are priests who are wagging their heads at Jesus on the cross, who later accepted Jesus Christ in His fullness. So if you slipped away from that warmth, that enthusiasm in Jesus, and you want Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to come into the life and renew that commitment, say, Lord, maybe I'm almost a backslider. I, I'm not exactly interested in how to term it. How to classify it. But Lord, I've kind of lost that zeal, that vim in Christ. And Lord, I, I want to claim the promise of Hosea 14.4 that says, I will heal your backsliding. Not merely forgive, I'll heal it. I think of a man who wasn't meeting like this. He came forward. We stepped in the pastor's study. We put our hands on the promise. I'll heal their backsliding. The man was an adulterer. He had all kinds of habits of sin. He put his hand right on the promise with us. And we asked God to heal, not forgive merely, but to heal. We told him we believed he would do it. We said, thank you, Lord. You are healing. You're not merely forgiving. You're healing. A couple of days later, the pastor and I went to his home. We said, how are you, brother? He said, wonderful. He said, the Lord has healed my backsliding. He said, every one of these deep sins, habits in which I was engaging, to which I was a captive, he has delivered me from every one of them, brethren. He healed me. He said, as I was there, committing my life to him, he healed my backsliding. That's the Christ, the wonderful Savior we have. Our Father in Heaven, thank You this beautiful Sabbath evening that Your sweet voice is saying, there's no God like Me. There's no one in, who can pardon like I can. There's no one who can heal like I can heal. I stand at the door and I knock. I just ask. Ask you to open the door. And I'll take care of those sins. And I'll take care of that weakness. And I'll seal you under the day of redemption as you continue to look to me. As we sing our closing song, Dear Lord, we pray that no one will feel embarrassed. Someone who has never given his heart to Jesus before, when he realizes how simple is the plan of salvation, just to confess our sins. Let Jesus forgive us and cleanse us. Let him take over. Lord, as we sing, 
We pray that each one of us make, may make a new commitment. The one who has never found you will make the first one. The one who slipped away will come back, trusting in you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. This media was brought to you by Audioverse, a website dedicated to spreading God's word through free sermon audio and much more. If you would like to know more about Audioverse, or if you would like to listen to more sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.